This will be the most valuable presentation you've ever seen in your entire career. I'm absolutely certain of it. It will change your career. It'll change your organization. I have absolutely no doubt. You will walk away from this conversation today. I've never given this presentation before. And you will say, my career changed today. Okay? All right. I'm going to tell you who I am uh, real quick. If you don't know who I am, I'm a sociologist, I'm an electrical engineer, and I'm an educator. So I own about 50 companies, four of them in industrial automation. I've been in the industry about 25 years. I spent the first 12 years of my career working for the manufacturer. That's one reason digital transformation fails. The vast majority of the people who you are hiring to help you digitally transform have no fucking idea what happens on a plant floor at all. So what is the one thing, what is, what is king on the plant floor? Always, 100% of the time. It's production. No one gives a shit about safety. No one cares about quality. No one cares about your wedding. No one cares about your kids. No one cares about anything but production. How do I know that? Because I worked on the plant floor for 12 years. Five years in a salt mine, two years in printing, three years in the steel industry, two years in tier one automotive. And in all, all of those stops, the only thing that was king was production. Everything else was bullshit. Everything else is bullshit. Security, safety, it's all bullshit. ESG is bullshit. It's all bullshit. No one cares. It's production. And I, it, it, does anybody disagree with me? Okay, it's production. It's widgets out the back door. All right? The people who are selling digital transformation have no idea how manufacturing works at all. This is We call this the ITOT divide. It's IT people selling to IT people to try and solve OT problems they know nothing about. That's problem number one. That's why digital transformation fails. So how do you mitigate that? How do you overcome that? It's really simple. You digitally transform from OT up. Okay, so number one in really advanced organizations, well, let's talk about IT for a second. What is your thoughts of IT and manufacturing? Does anybody have a positive impression of IT and manufacturing? Let me frame it a different way. Right, the CTO is a CT, no, right? IT is a security and compliance organization in the legacy manufacturer. And in the advanced manufacturer, they are an enablement organization, okay? Problem number one is OT people, or IT people selling to IT people to try and solve OT problems they know nothing about. That's why digital transformation fails. Who are the smartest people in any organization? any manufacturing or industrial organization. What are your functions? First off, let's start there. How many of you are managers? Uh, so above a plant manager or higher. So executive level, executive engi uh, engineers. Okay. So a third or engineers, uh, operations, by the way, funny, funny story. Uh, last year I spoke 50 times maybe 48, maybe 50 times. Do you know that there was only one conference where there was a single operations person in the audience? One person, 50 speeches. If I were speaking to Tesla, would I be talking to a bunch of executives? If I was talking to Amazon, would I be talking to a bunch of executives? No. So problem number one is that Problem number two is that in, in, in uh, members of industry and manufacturing, they send the wrong people to these conferences. If you were to send an operator here, you were to send a, ma a maintenance worker, uh, an electrician, a supervisor, a quality manager to this conference, they'd leave after three hours. They'd say, this is of no value to me. Why? These types of conferences are designed to trick executives into buying something flashy. Who is the dumbest person in an organization? We'll start there and then we'll talk about the, the smartest. Who's the dumbest person in an organization? Answer it. No. The customer actually is smarter than the dumbest person in an organization. It's a cheap executive. To chief executive. In a legacy organization, the chief executive is a continuous improvement strategist. And I have news for you. Digital transformation has nothing to do with continuous improvement at all. 
Digital transformation is groundbreaking innovation. So with that, why is Tesla awesome? Does everybody agree Tesla is awesome? Raise your hand if you think Tesla's awesome. If you don't raise your hand, you're going to have to tell me why you didn't raise your hand. No, I know what the answer is going to be. I don't like Elon. And then I'm going to tell you no one fucking cares. Okay, people who drive Teslas don't care. I don't care that you don't like Elon. I don't. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> no one cares that you don't like Elon. Elon is the human being who has done more for human sustainability than all other human beings who have ever existed in human history combined. And yet, your hubris, I don't like Elon. So therefore, Tesla's not awesome. That's a problem in our society. You allow your personal feelings and your personal feelings about a chief executive who's done more about sustainability for humanity to cloud your judgment about whether or not the company is awesome. Tesla is awesome. Tesla is awesome because they're not a car company. They're a data company. Tesla is a data company that builds cars. Uh, last August, Jim Farley, who's the CEO of Ford, he went on a manufacturing podcast and he lamented. He said, we lost. You, I encourage you to look up this podcast. You can see a clip of it on our YouTube channel. He said, we lost. We can't catch Tesla. And we lost for a couple of reasons. Lack of strategy. But the big reason is we've outsourced all of our IP. So Bosch, Rex Roth, so Bosch owns all the intellectual property inside of all of the modules inside of a Ford vehicle. So Ford's domain ends once they get to the module. But guess what's the most valuable thing on a vehicle? The data inside the module. And Ford doesn't own it, and Tesla does. And that's why Tesla's awesome. Okay? Why is Amazon awesome? Does everybody agree Amazon's awesome? Okay, there's nobody here disagrees about Amazon, right? Okay, all right. Why is Amazon awesome? That, that, well, actually, it comes down to that. It really does come down to that. Amazon's awesome because they predict what you're going to buy six weeks before you buy it. You don't even know what you're going to buy six weeks from now. But Amazon does. Can you tell me what you're going to buy six weeks from today? Okay, Amazon knows what you're going to buy six weeks from today with 98% accuracy. If we put all these smart people in this room together and I said to you, we're going to build a new company and that new company is going to deliver what anybody wants, 99% of the things you want, to your door for 40, in 48 hours or less with free shipping at the absolute best price, 99% of the time to 99% of the American population, how would you do that? How would you do it? Let, let's, let's, let's do a thought experiment. How, wh how, where would you start? So you got to stock everything, okay? You got to stock it close to where they live so we can get it to them 48 hours or less, right? Legacy thinkers, legacy thinkers, they'll go up on a whiteboard and they'll go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to build distribution centers everywhere. We're going to have DCs everywhere, Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to stock everything. They're going to be enormous. See, this is the Walmart model. This is what Walmart tried to do. This is why Walmart failed. Walmart had a legacy mindset. They thought of it manually. Amazon said, no, what we're going to do is we're going to partner with people who provide goods and services, and we're going to build an infrastructure upon which they will deliver to us in six weeks minus 48 hours to a distribution center the goods that we know you're going to buy with 98% accuracy. That's how Amazon does it. Okay, so now you should be sufficiently, holy shit, okay? You should be sufficiently, you should feel like you're in the dark because you are. And here's how I know. Because none of you, not a single person in this room is gonna be able to answer this question, okay? All of you have heard the term in the last five years. The shortest time was one year ago none of you will be able to answer this question correctly. What is digital transformation? And then you should really be scared. You are at the Digital Transformation Forum. 
All of you have heard of the term digital transformation. Some of you heard it five years ago. The shortest amount of time is one year ago. And nobody can answer what digital transformation is. I know you probably can because you watch our videos. So let's do a thought experiment. What is digital transformation? What do you think it is? Sorry, you sat closest to me. Take, that's digitization. So that's digitization. So that would be like taking a piece of paper and turning it into a digital dashboard I can access through Excel or a dashboard, right? That's digitization. By the way, that's what legacy people, that's what legacy manufacturers think digital transformation is. You know what digital transformation actually is? It's a strategy. It's a strategy for making data the primary commodity in your business. That's digital transformation. And the reason most people fail is because they don't even get the damn definition right. That's reason number three. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a, uh, we've got a lot of engineers in here. Does everybody know what a PLC is? Okay. What's the difference between a Control Logix L7 and the Opto 22 Groove Epic? So this, this board right here is in our office. Okay. So the We've got, we've got a mix of technologies here. We have a direct a Koyo, direct logic, a direct 205. Okay. We have a slick down here, Rockwell slick. We have an easy automation here, uh, easy rack PLC. And we have a Siemens S7-1200. And off to the side, we have our Opto 22 Groove Epic and a PLC next, PLC. What is the difference between an L, a Rockwell L7 PLC programmable logic controller, and the Opto 22 Groove Epic. Open architecture, closed architecture is one. Right. A Groove Epic is an industrial PC. It's an industrial PC on one processor and a PLC on the other. Why is that important? Why, why would it be important to have an industrial PC and our process controller together. Right, because you cannot unlock data. The most valuable data in your entire business are all the events that are happening as they're happening. How does Amazon predict what we're gonna buy six weeks before we buy it? They track every event. They track every single click in your browser. They know where you live. They know what stories you're watching on Instagram. Is, has anybody has anybody ever had this ex happen to them? They're talking to their husband or their wife or their kid about some product they've never talked about before ever and thinking about getting into skydiving. You've never talked about skydiving before in your entire life. And you say, I'm thinking about getting into skydiving. And then magically, magically, in just a couple of hours, what's the first advertisement you see when you're, when you're on your Google Chrome? What's the first advertisement you see? An advertisement for skydiving. Did you Google skydiving? Right, they're listening to you. They're collecting all the events, all the events of your life. And then what they're doing is they're using software to find patterns in that data you can't see with the naked eye. Most people are approaching digital transformation the wrong way. They're approaching it the way they approach building a piece of equipment. When you go to an OEM, a machine builder, and get a piece of machinery built, what are the, what are the things that you do when, when you send out your RFP? You send a functional specification, some alarm requirements, okay? You, you may send some hardware requirements. We're a Rockwell house. So you're going to use L7s. You're going to use add-on instructions. You're going to use UDTs when you do the process control. Here's our control theory. What's the one thing in a legacy manufacturer that's always missing from their RFP when they do a machine build relative to Tesla or Amazon, right? There's no, there's no, the way I summarize it is there's, there's nothing in there to say, 
this this machine must plug into our digital infrastructure this way. It must stream data in this way. I'm going to show you a demo here at the end with using a uh, Arduino Portenta C33, and I'm going to plug it into a unified namespace, a literal digital infrastructure. We're going to demo it at the at the very end. I'm going to I'm going to plug it in, and you're going to see why it is Tesla and Amazon are killing everybody. How long did it take Tesla to build Giga Shanghai? Anybody know? Nope, shorter. Nine months. From dirt with grass on it from to the first vehicle running off the line. Nine months. How long did it take Ford to build the Mustang EV manufacturing facility in outside of Detroit? It's not done, and they're on their sixth year. Okay. How did Tesla do that in nine months? Do they, they just have people out there cracking whips? How do they do it in nine months? Okay. What is one of Tesla's requirements if you're going to be one of their vendors? There's a key requirement. Well, let me ask this question. What ERP system does Tesla use? Does anybody know? No. They built it from scratch. It's called, it's called Tesla Warp. They built a digital infrastructure from scratch called Tesla Warp. All, all links in the supply chain must integrate to Warp. There's nobody at Tesla who's getting on the phone calling suppliers. No one. Lead times aren't six weeks. They're six days. They have a digital infrastructure upon which they solve the business's problems, and they do that iteratively over and over and over again, a common infrastructure. I'm going to show you what that means, what it looks like here in a couple minutes. Okay. They solve problems in weeks that takes their competitors months to solve. And in some cases, years. Tesla will be a $10 trillion company. And it is an empirical certainty. And you don't think they're awesome. But, but they don't, they're not in the business of manufacturing cars. The car doesn't matter. The, in, the manufacturing infrastructure we're building, the digital infrastructure we're building, that's what will change the world. That's what he kept saying over and over and over again. You may hear it in public comments as manufacturing. He talks manufacturing. That's our, that's our market value. What he means is, is we built a plant that will get rid of the assembly line. And think about that. The, third, the second industrial revolution was the assembly line. And during the fourth industrial revolution, Tesla's created a digital ecosystem that will move us away from the assembly line. Everything you know about additive manufacturing and linear processes, out the window. The most awesome companies in the world understand that. There's only one legacy company. I showed this. This is the digital transformation maturity distribution. This is 1,400 manufacturers that we've scored across these 10 industry four pillars. Okay, The 10 industry four pillars are operations, IT, engineering, quality, leadership, infrastructure, platform, network, connectivity, and strategy. There are 10 companies here in the top part of the distribution. Tesla is number one with a score of 86 out of 100. There's only one legacy manufacturer in that top 10. And it's Volkswagen North America. The nine manufacturers, the nine other manufacturers in there are all companies that started after the year 2000. All of the manufacturers from 1S and 2S below the mean, dead. Dead. No chance of survival. It's M&A. Their ship is passed. So what every manufacturer should be doing is scoring their digital future. So if you're an executive, is anybody in here an executive? Sits on a board? You sit on a board? So what you ought to, are you a manufacturer? All right. So what you need to do is your next board meeting is say, we need to score our digital maturity on a scale of zero to 100 across 10 industry four pillars. And if your score comes in 1S or 2S below the mean, sell your company. Get everything you can get now. And listen, I recognize that it, 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 most people in here would think it's all hyperbole. He's, it isn't. 
It's an empirical certainty. When was industry zero? Industry zero was Gutenberg's printing press. Industry one? Steam engine. Industry two, assembly line. Industry three, the PLC in 1969. Industry four, TCP IP winning the Protocol Wars in 1998. Industry five, GPT 3.5. Okay? If you're an industry three company, that is, you are still focused on automation, you're dead. If you haven't jumped the chasm yet, you're dead. This chasm. There is a, right here. Everybody know the technology S curve is? In continuous improvement? So this lower S curve here, this is industry three. When PLCs came out in 1969, people started investing money in automation. Actually, in the United States, we really didn't even start doing it until the late 80s, which is the reason we had to offshore jobs. Guess who adopted PLCs first? Who were the two nations who adopted automation first after the PLC was invented in 1969? Germany and Japan. And who was killing the United States in manufacturing by 1982? Germany and Japan. And Japan. So what did Americans do? What did American companies do in the 1980s? What was, it, what was the big movement, those of you who are Gen Xers like me, what was the big movement in the 1980s, since you're an executive in manufacturing, cut costs and offshore. Then you invested in technology in the 1990s while you were offshore. Then what was the big movement starting right around the year 2000, GE led it by bringing their water heater manufacturing facilities, reshoring back in the United States. Why? Because offshoring took your engineers away from your processes and your processes got old. TCP IP won the protocol wars in 1998 and industry four started. GPT 3.5 started the fifth industrial revolution. If you are still focused on automation, you're a dead company. If you're not a data company, you're a dead company. Let me say it again. If you're not a data company, you're a dead company. Dead. And I have nothing to sell you, by the way. So I'm not scaring you to sell you something. I have nothing to sell you. My mission is to help save and create middle-class jobs in the United States through manufacturing. That is my life's mission because I grew up in upstate New York in the 1980s and watched my family, my friends' families go from middle-class and upper-middle-class to working on farms and gas stations because manufacturing left and has never come back, even to this day. I own a home in upstate New York. I bought it in 2002 for $125,000, and today it's worth $185,000. My house in Dallas, which I bought two years ago for $550,000, today is worth $900,000. That's the difference between a vibrant middle class and a dead middle class. And manufacturing, manufacturing is the gateway. My mission is to help save and create middle class jobs. And we do that through digital transformation. So this speech is not about selling you something. It's a call to action. Know what digital transformation is. Have a digital strategy. And if you don't know what it is and you don't have a digital strategy, ask yourself, why? Ask yourself, why? Actually, do me a favor. Tell me why. Does anybody here have a digital strategy statement to share with me? Three sentences or less. Why, why data is going to be our primary commodity? Why do we care about it? Nobody has a digital strategy statement. You don't even have one? Why don't you have a digital strategy statement? Let's, let's go. Let's, what would be the reason you don't have a digital strategy statement? Yeah, you're, you're an executive. You have a mission statement. Okay. You have a list of values, core values. Okay. But you have a mission and you have values, right? But you don't have a digital strategy statement? like how you're going to make data the primary commodity? Why is it, why is it uh, when we go to an airport today, everybody is looking at their phone, no one's reading a book? 
I, don't you honestly, don't you think it's weird when you see somebody reading a book? When you see somebody reading a physical book, don't you think it's weird? Okay. Why is everybody looking at their phone and not reading a book? It's access to all human knowledge. Young people, we joke about like Gen Zers and millennials, their pains in the ass and all that stuff. I have four kids. My youngest is 16. So I got kids from 16 to 26. They are 10 times smarter. I like to think I'm a smart guy. Okay. My kids are 10 times smarter than I am. And your kids are 10 times smarter than you. Why? Their digital fluency is off the charts. Off the charts. What is the one thing that keeps manufacturers, if, there was, if you were going to distill down the objections to digital transformation into one, uh, one word or one sentence, what would that be? Right, cybersecurity. Fear of getting hacked. Okay? Fear of getting hacked. Do you know who doesn't worry about getting hacked? No, no, no. What companies don't worry about? Amazon and Tesla. Does Elon Musk have lots of enemies? Absolutely. I was speaking in San Francisco, and only one-third of the room said uh, Tesla was awesome. Two-thirds of the room hated Elon Musk. Hated him. So therefore, Tesla sucks. Okay, so what I'm saying is Tesla's got a lot of enemies because a lot of people hate their CEO. And Tesla doesn't worry about getting hacked? Why? What's the greatest defense against internet security risks? The greatest defense. Is it an air gap? It's having high digital fluency. So the point is, is that the reason people don't digitally transform, which in general, it's fear or a lack of knowledge, that fear gets mitigated by digitally transforming. Because if you're a digitally transformed organization, a digital organization who has the employee of the future working with them, the who's the employee of the future? It's a Gen Z. Uh, any, any, who, who's the hardest group to recruit and retain? Gen Z. Why? I'm a Gen Xer. When I came out of college, do you know that the retention rate for a Gen X person in manufacturing in 1998 was 80% for the first 12 months. Do you know what it is today for Gen Z? 11% in six months. 11%. Except if you are who? Tesla and Amazon. Are they just masters at recruiting? Who here has a recruitment and retention problem? Who here has a problem hiring people and keeping them in manufacturing? It's everybody. It's everybody. How do you solve that problem? Through digital transformation. Who here has a, a fear of getting hacked, being insecure digitally? It's everyone. And how do you solve that problem? Through digital transformation. What is it that most manufacturers spend their time doing? It's they spend most of their time trying to either fighting fires, that's number one, but number two, trying to do more with less. Become more efficient, more innovative. Right? Every manufacturer. How do you solve the problem of fighting fires? Digital transformation. You predict the problem before it happens. Everyone's been trying to do predictive analytics for 20 years. Why is it that no one's doing predictive analytics? Has anyone here tried a predictive analytics? So that is try to predict failure through some initiative, ML, AI. And how does that normally go? It's terrible, right? You fail. Why do you fail? Because garbage data in, garbage data out. Digital transformation mitigates the problem with gar garbage data in. All right, I'm going to show you what digital transformation looks like, and then I'm going to just go over some concepts. So this, I'm going to, I got to 
start a little program here. When an organization starts to digitally transform, when an organization starts to digitally transform, I'm gonna try and zoom in here so you guys can see this. This is a digital infrastructure. If you were to go to Tesla or Amazon, you guys have, may have heard the concept of the unified namespace, which is a, it's a architecture for building a digital infrastructure. Think of it as a single source of truth that captures all the events in the business, semantically organized. So imagine I have my enterprise, I have my sites, my areas, and my lines. That's ISA 95 part two. It's a standard for organizing businesses. If you have an ERP system, this is what the master data model looks like. Okay, so if you're using SAP or Epicor or Infor, it doesn't matter what you're using, they use ISA 95 part two to organize your business. That's the master data model. This is, a, this is an event hub. This is a digital infrastructure. So right now what I have is I have a organization, I have a location, I have an area inside that location, and I have a production line, and then I'm connected to a PLC. But I'm using Kep Server to do it. If I was using an Opto 22 Groove Epic, I would be using the Groove Epic to publish into this, as opposed to me having to use a piece of software to pull the PLC and put this data in here. So what I've got in here in this edge namespace is some simulation examples, some functions, and a bunch of ramp data, just basically data that goes up and down like this, okay? This, so let's assume for the sake of argument, I haven't even started my digital transformation journey. Where do I start? Well, I start with a business problem and I put an infrastructure in to solve it. So in this case, let's say what I need is insight into current state. If, when we go and we poll, we have a, a survey as part of the digital transformation maturity assessment. We'll ask manufacturers their subgroups, so engineering, operations, quality, executive leadership. We ask them three primary questions. What, do, what is your organization good at? What are you not good at? And what's missing? What do 91% of the respondents, 10,000 surveys, 91% of the respondents say, what's missing? What do, they, what, do they, what do they answer when they say what's missing? It's the data that they need to do their job. Do you want to know, you want to know what data your organization needs? Like, let's say you wanted to take an inventory. Tomorrow, I want to start digitally transforming. I'm going to write a digital strategy statement, and I want to take an inventory of all the data that my business needs. What's the best way to go do that? You take an inventory of every spreadsheet that's ever been built over the last 30 years. You have spreadsheets that you've built just for you. You have spreadsheets you've built just for you. You have spreadsheets you've built just for you. You take an inventory of those spreadsheets. Those spreadsheets are functions. They're functions of the business. If you're the scheduler, you have a spreadsheet that helps you manage the scheduler, the schedule. If you work in quality, you, I guarantee you have built a spreadsheet that helps you do your job, whether you're defining quality samples, collecting those samples, uh, aggregating the data. Spreadsheets are the inventory of all the problems in the business. You take all those spreadsheets and you pick the biggest, lowest, lowest hanging fruit. You, the number one lowest hanging fruit is I want insight into current state. I'm a supervisor. I want to know which equipment's running and where are we according to plan. Because nobody knows where they are according to plan. Nobody. That's why they have shift meetings at 9 o'clock at the beginning of first shift every day to talk about the problems from yesterday. What good are, is it talking about the problems from yesterday? What good is that? How many of you go home every single night, sit down with your wife and kids, and talk about the things that pissed you off yesterday? You don't. You talk about what you're going to do today and tomorrow. Legacy manufacturers live in the past. All day long. All day long. This is what a digital transformation initiative looks like. Okay? Let me... I'm gonna, we're gonna go through a, what a journey looks like. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna switch and we're gonna say, we're gonna go through phase one. And in phase one, I, wanna, I want insight into current state. I wanna calculate OEE. So in 12 or 16 weeks, I am at the end of 12 or 16 weeks, what I've done is I've taken all those events from my PLC running on the edge. I'm gonna take all the data from the edge, from the PLCs running on the edge, 
and I'm gonna turn it into something of actual value, okay? So all what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna calculate KPIs like availability, quality, performance, OEE, TEEP, mean time to repair and mean time between failure, and that's current state. That's not a calculation in an Excel spreadsheet. It's gonna update as, as the values update on our processes, okay? Then I'm gonna go, when I go to phase two, which is gonna be maybe week 12 through week uh, 24 to 36. So now what I've done is I've added in some ERP functionality, maybe our production order, our inventory. When I go to phase three, I am going to add in my CMMS integration. Maybe the last time that, line, that production line was maintained. All of these are integrations to all those systems, okay? Phase four, I'm gonna add in ISO 5501 or S88 batch compliance. So phase four, I'm gonna add in endpoints so that I have in my digital infrastructure, in real time, as we're operating, all of the compliance data I need so that I stay ISO 55001 compliant or S88 compliant. The, every problem, yeah, I, what I did was I just solved four business problems iteratively over the course of 12 weeks on the same infrastructure. And then when I'm ready, when I'm ready to solve my problems, I, I wanna start predicting the future, I use this data and software to find patterns in that data you can't see with the naked eye. This is why Amazon's awesome. This is why Tesla's awesome. The challenge you guys have is that, what if I asked you, if, you, if, I, if I tasked you with going back to 1870, and making the case to the world for electricity, how would you do that if people don't understand the value of electricity? If I were to send you back to 1870 and say, go make the case for investing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in electrical infrastructure, how would you do that if people in 1870 cannot appreciate the value of electricity? You wouldn't. You know what you would do? You'd get it approved on one street. And you, would, and you would eliminate the guy who goes and lights the lamps every day at dusk, one at a time as he's walking down the street, and you would turn that into one guy flipping a switch at 6 p.m. and all the lights come on. That's what you would do. Digital transformation is a strategy for making data the primary commodity of your business. It starts with education. The speech is that, okay? It starts with scoring, knowing where I am in my digital maturity. It, it starts with identifying the first business problem I want to solve, creating an architecture, a digital open architecture like this. Every single one of our clients, 228 clients, has this infrastructure. Every single one of them. So what do you guys need to do when you leave here? What do you need to do? You should, hopefully you're sufficiently scared, right? You need to go to the highest ranking person in your organization. You need to ask them this question. What is our digital strategy? And if they don't give it to you in three sentences or less, you don't have one. And that's where you start. You start with a digital strategy. Then what you do is you bring a partner in and you have that partner score you. I don't care who that partner is. You need to score your digital maturity. You need to inventory your problems. You need to create a digital infrastructure. You need to solve those problems one at a time on one common digital infrastructure. You will get smarter as an organization. The technology S-curve, you will get smarter. Your knowledge will increase. And guess what? What you will want to solve, the problems you want to solve, they will increase by knowledge squared. So you're going to spend a little bit of money up front to solve your first problem and you're spending a shit ton of money on the back end to save hundreds of millions of dollars over the long run, all right? Next steps, you guys can go to our YouTube channel, 4.0 Solutions. You can go to our Industry 4 Discord server, so you can go to iiot.university forward slash Discord. I highly recommend you go to the Discord server, okay? Uh, there's 5,000 Industry 4 professionals in there who can answer your question, all right? Thank you for having any any questions. Yes, so uh, finance, play ARAP, Part of the presentation that I just I didn't go into was uh, what how does manufacturing work? All manufacturers are the same, by the way. The only place they differ is on the plant floor. Every single manufacturer is exactly the same. 
They sell stuff in the CRM. They plan to manufacture it in the ERP. They execute the manufacturing in MES. They monitor their plants with SCADA. They control it with PLC HMI. They manage their warehouse and inventory with warehouse management systems. They get paid and they pay their bills with ARAP and they start all over again. Every single manufacturer without a difference, with, with no difference. They're all the same. So yes, we work very closely with finance. Why? Because the ultimate goal is to look at cost in real time by asset. In real time, which assets are the most, most valuable? Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. Sorry for only going over a couple of minutes. Appreciate you guys. Was that valuable, by the way? Valuable? Scale of one to five? Uh, five? Is anybody going to give me a three or below? Raise your hand. All right, good. 4.0, yes. Awesome.